headed by the team of legendary composers Mahito Yokoda and Koji Kondo, Super Mario Galaxy distinguished itself from its previous entries in the series by putting a musical focus more on a grand sweeping orchestral score. While Mahito originally wanted to feature pop music and Latin American instruments, Kondo rejected the idea, stating that he wanted this Mario title to appear a bit more mature. Eventually, lead producer Miyamoto agreed to continue with an orchestral score, citing that it made the game feel more epic as a result. This track we are looking at today is one of the more famous pieces, Good A Galaxy, which is among the first songs the player hears in their playthrough. Interestingly, in contrast to the many locales that Mario visits, the theme to Good A Galaxy doesn't actually begin until the player flies down and hits the landing port. This is a great way to build anticipation for the music and the level to come. Let's try to unpack the song now. There is a myriad of small details that a listener might not uncover the first time around. With an intro, section 1, 2, and 3, a build up, and then a loop back, the song takes full advantage of its short length of 1 minute and 21 seconds by use of its incredible melodies. There is never a point in the song where there is a break in melody or a rhythm section. Also, the song tends to repeat a melodic section twice, as you'll see in the song, with a variation on the second time around, of course, before moving on to the next section. On the last point on melody, notice how each melody line stays generally within its octave. This is an important tool as a composer so that the melodies that are represented are easily hummable and don't wander around too much. Some final notes on the overall structure of the song is that the tempo is set at a lightning 154 beats per minute. I was initially surprised at this discovery, but the fast tempo really does propel the song forward. Let's now take a look at the instruments Mahito Yokoda and Koji Kondo had at their disposal. In the soundtrack, they acquired a 50-person symphony orchestra, which seems like a perfect size for a game like this. Large enough to capture the vastness of space, it's still small enough to have some intimacy at certain spots. In the song specifically, the composer chose a standard orchestral arrangement. Featuring the woodwinds, piccolo, and clarinets, the brass, French horns, trumpets, trombones, and tuba, the percussion, which features the crash cymbal, timpani, and snares, the glockenspiel, then the harp, and then the string sections. While most of these instruments are played as an ensemble, a few, namely the piccolo, tuba, and glockenspiel, are solo instruments. In my recreation of the song, I chose to split the violins into two different sections to add color to each. You can also see that both the cello and double bass have pizzicato as well as are played legatoly as well. Let's take a quick look at the panning and volume before moving on to the actual sections. In terms of panning, you can see that I switched around a few instruments from their natural orchestral panning. Firstly, the piccolo is given dominance on the left speaker, which is complemented when the clarinets enter in the following part. Interestingly, the trumpets are panned left as well, which really makes them stand out, especially in the intro. The snares and timpani are panned to the upper right when they're normally panned to the upper left. This was probably done to contrast the string section and piccolo. Next you can see that I chose to split the two violas into different panning arrangements to widen the mix. For volume, each section of the orchestra, whether woodwinds, brass, or strings, are generally set at a certain volume. For example, you can see that the woodwinds are among the loudest instruments, followed by the string sections. The brass play more of a background role in the song, as does the percussion. In conclusion, one of the most important factors in the Super Mario Galaxy soundtrack as a whole is the EQ. 
The soundtrack is specifically more focused on the high end rather than the deep basses and tubas. In the master EQ, you can see that I did a, a low bass cut here and a high shelf to further boost the high end of the song, as well as a few other adjustments. With the instruments in mind, let's now unpack what this song has to offer. The introduction throws most of the instruments we see throughout the song right at us. Out of all the sections, this introduction is by far the tensest, perhaps to increase the drama of the following lighter sections. Starting from the clarinets, you can see that they trill between the G and the A, and are doubled with the violas to give them more pronouncement in the mix. With the brass section, the trumpets are the resounding melody that sounds atop everything else. The melody itself utilizes fifth intervals, which gives them a majestic mood when played in direct unison. These notes on the bottom are my key switches. The D sharp switches the instrument to staccato, you can hear in the first few notes, and the D, the D switches to mercado. Anytime you see these notes on the bottom here, just know that the instrument in question is switching to a different style of playing. The next brass instrument, the trombones, come in during the second half of the intro and play a nice swell leading into section 1. To note, they are also doubled by an octave. The tuba, along with the double bass, support the low end, especially with the two playing octaves. This is probably the only section with this much low end. The timpani and the crash cymbal enter the piece with a strong triplet. The last note here is especially accented with the crash cymbal. Later on in the second half, you can see that the timpani rolls with the transition to section 1. The harp and viol violins play a similar function with both ascending diatonically. The violins are also doubled by an octave and hold on this last D note to combine with the swell of the instruments. The last instrument we haven't discussed, the cello, doesn't actually play on the first beat of the second measure here, but rather the second. This provides extra intrigue for the listener rather than just one big note. And here is it all together. Section 1 is where the meat of the song comes into focus. Notice this break between the two sections. If I were to close this break, the two sections would unfortunately blend too closely to each other. And here is it with the break. The composer, I feel, wanted a bit of space between the intro and section 1. Like I stated before, notice how the melody in the horns and violas are repeated twice. This is a theme for the rest of the song. Now let's take a look at the French horns. You can see that they use fifth intervals throughout most of this section. This melody in itself is actually a combination of four different subsections. The first three sections are simply this four note pattern that begins with two staccato notes. Here's the second, the third, the final subsection uses only sustain notes. Interestingly, this last section here uses both parallel motion and contrary motion in its intervals. The first two intervals here, both voices move downward one, and then in the second interval jump, the top voice moves down while the bottom voice moves contrary upward. These four subsections are repeated once more with a last variation at the end. In this last variation, the sustained notes are held on for a little bit more time.
with the percussion it might look a little complex but much of it is repeated in the entire song from here on out the crash symbol makes its second and final appearance to cap off this new section the timpani mostly play these triplets to propel us into a new measure The timpani stay the same except for this last part here at the end of the section, where you can see that they sort of drift off in volume. Snares really give the song the needed momentum it needs. The taking them out would absolutely lose the listener's interest quickly, so let's try that. Take note on how the snares are not always played constantly. It's vitally important to have breaks no matter how small in all your instruments. With that in mind, the snares also have a quick gap right in the middle here. This gap is the third beat of the measure, which as I said before gives a little space for the music. One last thing is that the snares combine both the standard snare hits rolls at the end of each. The only last instrument section we need to talk about are the strings. The violins are not included, however. Beginning with the violas, they double with the French horns note for note, so we don't need to cover them. For the cello and the double bass, they are doubled together. They are played in pizzicato, which means that the players use their fingers to pluck the notes rather than the bow. To add a bit of spice, the composer decided not to just alternate back and forth between these two notes, but to sometimes double the top note. This sort of pattern reminds me of the song Bulls on Parade, the opening riff by Rage Against the Machine. It's no wonder why both use this pattern as it produces a very powerful sound. Now as a transition instrument between the two sections, the harp does a full glissando up and down fully. If you take a look at the piano roll, the first few seconds here are repeated twice around. This is to simulate a second roll by the other hand. Section 2 is marked off by the piccolo, so let's start there. The melody begins through use of a fourth interval. The fourth interval in melody is quite popular in music. Just think of the fourth theme in Star Wars, Here Comes the Bride, Amazing Grace, or the Star Trek theme for some examples. Also notice how the vibrato of the piccolo is, is extremely present. This is in contrast to the more ensemble strings and brass of before. Anyways, after this first interval, you can see that it does this nice trill here and then leaps up to the high D. This D is actually the root of the D major chord. As you'll see when we get to the violins, the violins play the D major chord without the D in the bottom. So the piccolo completes the whole chord together. The D then nicely resolves back to the C note, where it then repeats the melody verbatim. This last part here copies the trill parts of before, but shifts with the changing chord progression. Moving on to the clarinets, they are the perfect complement to the piccolo. Now let me move the clarinet piano roll into the piccolo piano roll and you'll better see the intervals of each. The highlighted is the clarinet. Now what's intriguing here is the fact that while this um, first interval here is a major third, the clarinets are an octave down which give this really rich tone. After this first interval here, the clarinet assumes another third interval, this time as the home note of C. 
following that, two instruments use fourth intervals here after the trill, and then major and minor sixth before concluding back to the third interval of the four. As you can see, opposed to the static fifth intervals of the horns before, this piccolo and clarinet duo changes its intervals throughout the melody. Think of the violins as the pad throughout section 2. Later on, the violas join in too in the second half of the section. Like I stated before, the violins play disconnected chords that don't have a root. As in previous instrument parts, you'll see that the first four chords are repeated twice, with the second time having a variance in this chord. After the um, second major second interval here, the chord changes to fourth intervals to give a warmer and richly tone. Lastly, pay attention to the dynamics I have in these strings. I can't stress how important it is to have strings that flow with the song. This vital fact is what separates the synthetic sounding strings from the real thing. The cello and the double bass, still doubling each other, soften up by playing these marcato notes as opposed to the pizzicato. No longer are they playing the octave leaps, but with the brightness of the piccolo lead, they become a lot less low-end heavy. They really only change during the last por portion of this section, both switching their root note with the changing chord progression. I especially like this leap up to the A note here from the E. It provides the extra lift the song needs. It's just a taste of all the instruments in the section. In this build-up, let's continue from the bass and cello. Again, the same rhythmic pattern is present, but the notes this time don't move with the chord progression until two measures over here. Going up from the cello, the violas serve two functions. This is where I needed the two um, sections of the violas. One section plays these rising chords, while the other plays staccato stabs. The violins double with the rising chord progression. The harp in this build up is interesting. It plays a full glissando up and down the scale. But the second time around, it only goes halfway up before finally ascending to the top E note. Also take note of the second hand glissandos here. Tippany also becomes more active in this section. They mostly accent the sharp staccato notes we've heard in the violas, cellos, and bass. It really provides the extra thump to these notes. So to make this section clearer to understand, let's break it up into chunks. For the instruments that play the rising chord progression, the French horns, the trumpets in the second half, the violins, and the violas all play together in unison. For the instruments that use the staccato pattern, the timpani, violas, 
cello and double bass all play the staccato. Once you realize that this buildup is essentially only these two functions with the added harp and the percussion, the snares, it suddenly becomes not so complex. This next section is perhaps one of my most favorites in video game music. Since the violins contain the melody here, let's begin there. Primarily, the violins take over as the lead melody. Once again, as with the piccolo melody, the strings melody opens with a fourth interval before a dramatic leap upward, an octave up. Intriguingly, this whole melody actually breaks a common rule in music writing, namely that a melody should take breaks at certain points. This melody, though, does not and continues as one unceasing flow throughout. How then is this motif so incredible without this golden rule of melody writing? One possible explanation could be due to the utilization of sustain notes, such as in the middle of bar 40 here. What I mean by this is that in certain longer notes, such as this note here, the listener's brain can finally readjust to the sequence they have just heard. This could be considered a break in their mind. To be fair, a rule that this melody does fall in line with is repeated notes, as you'll see is, in, is prominent in this melody. And here. In the last half of the section, the violins jump up jump up an octave and double with itself the same melody of before. In the violas, they just double the violins an octave below to add extra weight to the melody. The cello is split into two with one continuing the pizzicato leaps that we've heard in section one and the other performing this counter melody. The pizzicato, as opposed to before, moves along with the chord progression. The two notes it does play are not also always octave leaps as well, sometimes reaching for closer intervals as well. The double bass pizzicato becomes more simpler in this section, only accenting the downbeats of the measures. Moving on to the brass section, the French horns double exactly with the cello line. It's only in section 3b where they add an additional major second and third intervals. Now both the trumpets, trombones, and tuba all play these stabby staccato notes, which blend really well with the pizzicato. It should be mentioned that the trumpets and trombones occasionally use these sustain notes, so they're not all exactly staccato. Now let's speak to what the woodwinds are doing. First, the clarinets begin ascending up the C major scale two octaves. And then in the second octave here, you can see that the piccolo joins in two. The harp as well, although a few moments before, adds to this rising build to the next part. In the last instrument, the one that really gives the shimmer to the piece, the glockenspiel, finally makes its arrival in the climax of the song. It is adjusted at just the right level so as to not add undue Christmas-like vibes, which the instrument is known for. At the end, you can see that the piece loops back to section 1 instead of the intro. Now it's time to play the song back in full. Take note of the things we've discussed before, such as in the intro, how the swell propels us into section 1. 
how in section one the French horns and the violas double each other to give a kingly, rich tone. In section two, how the piccolo and clarinets use harmonies. And in section three, how the melody is displayed in many instruments. The Galaxy was a delight to recreate in this presentation, yet also incredibly complex with its small nuances. The composer, whether Kondo, Yokoda, or both, clearly knew how each instrument can be used as a function rather than just how tradition tells us so. This song is at the forefront of most people's minds when they think of Super Mario Galaxy's delightful melodies. Craving more analysis of Super Mario Galaxy? My friend Christopher C. U., a professional composer, arranger, and producer, explores the music theory behind Good A Galaxy and other interesting tidbits. I can't recommend his analysis enough, so if you want to see the second part of this analysis, head on over to his channel to watch his intriguing video. Thank you for watching and listening along as I continue the journey to uncover the tips and tricks the great composers of the past have put into their songs. Thanks, and I hope you have a productive day.